You already know this, but these things are notoriously unreliable. They cost a fortune to maintain and to fix. They're not that fast and they're just massively overrated. Or at least that's what the internet would lead you to believe. But like, there can't be any truth to that, can there? Because the FD RX-7 has a huge and loyal fan base. So surely all of those fans, they can't be wrong, can they? Let's find out. <laughs> Okay, just a quick refresher here. The FD RX-7, or the technically the FD3S RX-7, is the third generation RX-7. And just like the previous two iterations of it, it is a front-engined, real-drive, two-seat sports car powered by a rotary engine. And this was produced from 1992 to 2002. But there's a little bit more to it than just that. Mazda engineered as little weight as possible into the FD chassis, bolted two turbochargers to the 1.3-litre rotary engine, tuned the brakes and suspension to outhandle pretty much every other performance car on the market, and then wrapped it in some of the sexiest bodywork to ever come out of a paint booth. Right from the beginning, the RX-7 was an absolute game changer, and it won plenty of awards. But it wasn't perfect. We'll get to why later. But because of this, Mazda couldn't leave it alone. See, the 1992 to 1995 RX-7 is technically a Series 6, but in 1996, the Series 7 was released with improved driving dynamics thanks to a host of electronic and mechanical upgrades. And then in 1998 came this, the Series 8 RX-7, and it has loads of changes. More efficient turbochargers were fitted, a new front fascia improved cooling, and inside the instrument cluster, steering wheel, and seats were all changed, to name just a few. And then we come to the trim specs and special editions, and just like any good Japanese performance car, are available in an abundant array of numbers. And for even more details, go to Redriven.com and check out the awesome and completely free Redriven cheat sheet. But the thing is, and this is going to depend on where you're watching this from, even though there's heaps of different ones available, many markets only received like one or two different variants. That was until the grey import world started importing the special Japanese market only stuff to other countries. But this can bring with it many risks, which again we'll cover a little bit later. Actually, in saying that, all RX-7s come with a few risks. Thanks to the RX-7 being so genetically blessed from birth, they have become incredibly popular amongst the tuning community, but this can often mean many examples have been modified poorly or just downright abused, then almost reverse engineered to appear standard again, and then potentially sold to you with some story that it was only driven by the seller's grandmother to church on Sundays. But if there is any truth to that, my god you as a sexy grandmother because Look at this thing. Now, the first thing that strikes you about this, obviously, you know, besides the incredible good looks, is just the size of it. Like, it's been a while since I've seen an FDRX7, and I kind of forgot how small they are. And even weight-wise, these are pretty light. These weigh around about 1,300 kilograms, which is around about the same as a GR Yaris. But back to the looks, this thing is so incredibly well proportioned. Like, a lot of, like, front-engine sports cars can look very, very long in the front, almost like they're, I don't know, making up for a lack of length with the owner in some way, but this one, just perfect proportions. And also, like, it's somehow achieving this, this balance between being like feminine, like curvaceous, but also like muscular and aggressive all at the same time. Like I just wanna, I just wanna touch it. Maybe that's just me, but it's just, ah, oh, it's just beautiful. And then you've got all these little details that I love. Like first of all, these vents down here, I'm pretty sure these are fake. I normally hate fake vents, but when it's on this and it looks like that, it looks gorgeous. I love the fact that it kind of breaks up this area. So it makes this part look shorter and it kind of almost looks like the power of the engine's like coming out of that vent. Love that. Also, I love that the door handles are incorporated into here. They could have put it here, but then it would have broken all this up and made it look ugly. They've hidden the door handle here to keep this all nice and simple and smooth and elegant. Bloody superb job. But you know what can ruin these very, very quickly, and many people do ruin them, is fitting cheap dodgy body kits, painting them in some ridiculous color and fitting enormous rims to them. Look, I get that we're all entitled to our ex express ourselves in our own different ways when modifying a car, but doing all that stuff and putting some giant stupid wing on it just ruins the entire thing. If you're going to modify it, do it exactly like this. Super high quality BBS alloys, it's got fantastic suspension, it's the perfect height. There's, it's black, so it's just subtle and understated, not over the top, no dumb stickers. This, this is great. If it looks like this, horrible. You're ruining it. 
Now guys, we just have to pay some bills for a second. If that bothers you and you hate saving money, just skip ahead about 30 seconds. First up, a massive thank you to our finance partner, Driver. Guys, if you need help financing your next car, go to Driver because the whole thing can be done online so simply. You can get pre-approval in literally just minutes and there are no hidden fees. Head to the link down there to get started. And next up, the best wipers we have ever used, WiperTech. Easy to order, easy to install, they fit perfectly. And if you order them from the link down there, you're gonna get 15% off and get express shipping for free. Okay, now inside, the first thing that grabs you, especially if you have dodgy hips and no core strength, is just how low you sit. Like you go to get in the car and you, you're like, oh, I'm gonna hit the seat soon. No, keep going lower, 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 and eventually you hit the seat. So yeah, if you're uh, not the fittest of people, this is gonna be a challenge getting in. And then once you're in, it's almost a bit kind of old school Porsche 911 a little bit. Like you sit just slightly off center. And also, like the ergonomics are good, like the driving position is good, but for me, not great. Like they're, they're it's, I just, I've been in this car a little while now and I just can't quite get just comfortable enough. In the Australian delivered and US delivered versions, the steering wheel is tilt adjustable, but in the JDM ones, they're not. And I just wish the steering wheel was like that much higher. That'd be, that'd be good. And just, yeah, I'm just, I don't know what it is. I'm just not quite right in here. Also, it's, quite small in here like i forgot how kind of tiny and cocooned you are like it's like everything's yeah everything's small which helps with the whole experience because it feels like a proper sports car but besides that look design wise i love how like driver centric the overall design is like everything kind of swoops and flows for the driver it's almost like the car's way of saying to the passenger shut up and hold on because this is all about the guy behind the wheel and then we have the materials used it is from the 90s and it's really obviously from the 90s. Everything is a slightly different shade of black and everything is plasticky. Like that's kind of soft touch. There's a little bit of squidge here and there, but yeah, it's a lot of, lots of hard plastic everywhere. Also, depending on which one you're looking at, the seats can be different. In the really top spec, like the Spirit R, you're gonna get those lovely Recaros. These seats in this particular one, really nice. They have got that kind of 90s squidge and cushioning to them, so they're not super kind of, it doesn't hug you, but it does. Like, it's comfortable on a long trip and through the corners it does support you, but it's just, it's a little bit too spongy for me. Um, something I've just noticed as well, there's like a, specific padded section here for like your left calf muscle so you can kind of like grip on but for dear life via your legs and your core to hold on through corners now expanding from the amount of hard black plastic in here we get to the wear and tear and this is where things get interesting because like there's a lot of shaking and movement like this is to be expected of so much brittle old 20 year old plastic in here but yeah there's a yeah there's a bit of movement in kind of everything just a little bit that's a standard rx7 thing they kind of all do that but as far as actual like wear and tear in this particular car absolutely excellent like the door cards all the textures are still there there's a little bit of wear on this gear knob here steering wheel feels lovely seats the fabric and the seats are spot on the carpets are great so you, like wear and tear wise ignoring brittle plastic good now, practicality up front, you've got a cute little glove box there, not real large. You've got another little storage space just here. You've got spots for coins. You've got a little cubby hole here, which is perfectly sized for your phone, and it's hidden by a little plastic trapdoor. And some RX-7s will be jealous of this because it's not broken on this one. Now in the back seat, I'm exactly eight centimeters taller than the star of David Finch's 1995 crime thriller RX-7, Brad Pitt. This is in my driving position, and I honestly feel like I'm sitting in a toilet. There is no room back here. Why they even have a back seat back here is ridiculous because this is not for humans. As far as wear and tear goes, none. No one's ever sat back here. Practicality? Are you kidding? Of course not. No one sits back here. Now, as far as practicality in the boot goes, it's actually, it's pretty spacious back here. There is no spare wheel under me. That, that certainly helps. But also, the ridiculous rear seats, I think they fold flat. Hang on. There we go. They fold flat, giving you that much more cargo space. It's honestly, for what this car is, this is pretty good. But just one warning, because it's a glass lift back, this can quickly become almost like a greenhouse. So don't store any, I suppose, chocolates or fish back here. It'll be disgusting. Okay, tech and features wise, guys, we're talking 1990s here, so let's not go getting too excited about tech and features. But even in saying that, this car is all about the driving experience, so really anything else is just gonna be a distraction. But look, as standard, from 1992, you're gonna get a CD play up, climate control, cruise control, leather all over the place, central locking, power mirrors and windows, and more. 
But if you dabble into the, uh, let's say, plethora of special editions, the amount of like cool toys you're gonna get, is pretty cool. We're talking a Bose acoustic wave music system, Bilstein suspension, BBS alloy wheels, lightweight Recaro seats. The list of driving and performance specific enhancements and features just go on and on. And obviously if you want like Apple CarPlay or Android Auto or really any kind of phone connectivity, you're gonna have to do what this car has done and get an aftermarket system. Now as far as safety goes, guys, we are talking about a like an early to mid 90s rear wheel wheel drive sports car here so it's safe to say that safety wasn't exactly high on the priority list but to take you through exactly what safety features it does have it feels only right to cut to another star of David Finch's 1995 crime thriller RX7 it's Mr Morgan Freeman you know this isn't going to have a happy ending if you were to crash an RX7 all you have to keep you safe to keep you alive is one, maybe two airbags and ABS. That's it. No traction control, no electronic stability control. Very little separates you from a rapidly approaching and harsh future. And as always, for all of these specific details of features and safety and equipment, all that sort of stuff, readdriven.com, check out the cheat sheet. Okay, so what do they like to drive? Well, look, if you search FD RX7 on YouTube, you're going to be presented with thousands of hours of these things being driven at 10 tenths on racetracks and across some deserted mountain pass. But the thing is, that sort of driving is going to make up for, what, maybe 5% of the car's driving experience. 95% of the time, you're going to be dealing with scenarios like this, like potholes and traffic and driving around metropolitan and built-up areas. So, rather than just rehashing and repeating what everyone has said about driving these on the limit, let's answer some real-world questions. Is it intimidating? Well, look, yes and no. See, here in Australia, most people drive SUVs and, like, full-drive dual-cab utes, and this thing is very low, and you sit very low in a very low car, so you are aware that they might not see you. They might turn in on you or change lanes onto you, so you're constantly kind of like, is someone going to hit me? Is someone going to hit me? So that bit is a bit intimidating. But then in saying that, because it just feels so small and light and nimble, and it is a pretty small car, it gives you this like confidence to kind of like get in and out of traffic or in and out of tight scenarios, and it's really responsive. So when you floor it, like you're out of trouble in a heartbeat. But being so low and old, the ride must be terrible. Well look, this car is fitted with some delightful blitz coilovers and a bunch of other suspension mods and I was honestly expecting it to drive like an old horse and cart, but it doesn't. It soaks up the bumps really, really nicely. It's still firm, like it doesn't feel like a luxury car by any means, but like here's a roundabout and through here, like, oh, feels so nice, but then bumps on the other side, totally okay. Apparently they handle like a go-kart, does it still? Look, obviously I can't push the handling limits driving around the suburbs of Sydney and I'm going to sound like a complete wanker saying this, but you can sense that there is a real depth of talent here. Like I was saying to Sam that's on camera before, there's something about cars that were designed from the ground up to be a sports car. I love hot hatches, muscle cars, all that stuff, great. Modified cars, great. But when a car is built, like this platform is only meant for this. There's something about a sports car. Its whole, its whole objective is just, just to make you enjoy the driving experience. And yeah, you can still tell. It's an old rotary. What's that like? Well, you know what? Put your foot down. Okay, bloody lovely. Great amount of power. But it is so different to a piston engine or even an electric car. Like there's, it's like linear and smooth and it's got this, you know, because of the turbos, it's got this nice muscular torque to it, but it's just, it feels like, it's almost like the driving version of like pouring like a, a slightly thin viscosity custard out of a container. Just kind of like flows out of it really nicely and it's just tasty and delicious. And also, because there's, you know, there's a little bit of turbo lag because it's an older car, it gives you a moment to think, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to jeopardise my licence right now? So I like the turbo lag and it also, it just gives it, this, you know, a bit of a muscular feel to it. And then we have the gear shift. Like it's a Mazda, these guys made the MX-5 and this thing is just so delightful to use. But it's not just the gear shift that's great, like the weight of the clutch and even the weight of the brake and the accelerator, even the weight of the steering, it feels like 
the resistance or the ratio of weight to all of the control surfaces all match each other. It's like a really good band playing together like they're in their prime. It's awesome. Okay, you love driving it. Are there any negatives? Well, yeah, there are. So remember when I was talking about the brittle plastics? Well, if you're driving over any kind of rough roads, even slightly rough roads, the whole interior kind of does its like its best impression of an interpretive percussionist because there's rattles and things going on all over the place and they tend to change depending on what the road surface is. Like this is a pretty smooth surface but there's a rattle over there somewhere and then before there was like a rattle in here somewhere. So yeah, you can tell the car is alive but it sounds like it's kind of complaining to you. And the other negative, and it's not necessarily the car's fault, but because this is quite an overt sports car, everybody wants to tailgate you or race you. Hang on, just going through this roundabout again. Just love this bit. Oh. Oh. Yeah, everybody wants to tailgate you or cut you off. So you're constantly being nagged through people. Another corner, two seconds, hang on. Oh, it's just so lovely. But yeah, the tailgating's annoying. Look, overall, and like this is coming from a Porsche 911 fan, this thing offers like equivalently amazing driving experiences and the whole kind of feel of a 911 for tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars less but it comes with some conditions now if you're an rx7 fan you're not going to want me to talk about fuel consumption but i have to after talking to plenty of people in the owners groups and trolling through forums and stuff these things when you like pressing the loud pedal can get very expensive when it comes to fuel at best we've seen you know figures of 12 to 13 litres per 100 k's. Worst case scenario, we've seen figures well over 30 litres per 100 k's. Ouch. Now, if you are seriously looking at buying an RX-7, and especially a grey import, it is so important to be careful of dodgy grey importers. We've heard some horror stories from winding odometers back, changing entire instrument clusters to show lower kilometers, even falsifying documents. So if you are in the market for one of these, please make sure it's a reputable importer. Now, pricing-wise, once upon a time, these were popular among young performance car enthusiasts because they were affordable sports cars. These days, they're still popular among enthusiasts, but they're not exactly affordable anymore, as you can see in the graphic. The thing is, Bart, the team that developed this car, they set out for this to be a future classic, and as the figures are showing, this has become a classic. So nearly $90,000 for this might actually be a bit of a bargain. But in saying that, it is one thing to be able to afford to buy an RX-7, but it's a whole different thing to be able to maintain an RX-7, because at the end of the day, it is a 20-year-old performance car, and parts are getting expensive. So yeah, fuel, oil, spare parts, and your hopes and dreams are gonna take a hit. Now you might think that you're an RX-7 fan, but to prove you are, you've gotta wear this T-shirt, which is available at redriven.com in the merch store. Go buy it. Okay, before we get into the potential issues of the FD RX-7, firstly, a massive thank you to the guys at Go Garage here in Sydney. They're importers for these and all JDM cars. And thank you so much for lending us this to film. You guys are legends. Secondly, to everybody in the RX-7 owners groups and forums. So many of you reached out to us helping us with researching this video, especially this part. Without you, we couldn't make these videos. Legends. Okay, let's kick off with the exterior here. Firstly, the paint. If it's uncared for, like if it's left out in the sun and hasn't been like cleaned and polished regularly, the paint, especially on pre-1994 models, it can fade and even crack and even peel. Okay, next up, if the RX-7 you're looking at has been fitted with a body kit, make sure it's a quality body kit and make sure it has been fitted correctly because we've seen and read so many reports of like dodgy cheap body kits that have just been screwed and glued on, ruining the car. Basically, it can let moisture and water and air get in behind the panels and things go horribly wrong all over the place. Some early models can suffer from like a ripple effect on the front bar just from being exposed to the hot Aussie climate a lot, but not that common on later models. The bonnet latch and the hinges for the bonnet can get a bit squeaky. It's not a major problem, but some people mistake it for being a suspension issue. It's not. Squeaky hinges and bonnet latch. Okay, the headlights and the taillights, they can build up condensation and that actually affects the performance of the light itself. You've got to get that checked out, either repaired or even replace the whole light. Then there are a few reports of rust. It's not a, like a major concern, but it can happen. It can happen around the edges of the doors, also around the wheel wells and the wheel arches. 
Also, check the seals under the rear tail lights and the body, the spare wheel well, around the bonnet hinges and area around the bonnet hinges, and the rear hatch and behind the rear bumper. Apparently, the door handles can have a few issues with like coming off easily. And this one's a bit of a kind of a funny one, and it's honestly not that common, but the actual pop up headlights, even when you turn the headlights off and the car off, they can just continue to pop up and down. Generally, it's just the relay inside the motor actuator, but still, pop up headlights. So cool. Also, Try to avoid running into anything or having anything run into you from behind because especially on the Series 8, the front bar and the rear wing are bloody expensive. Actually, one of the big problems with these is dodgy repair work. So if you are looking at buying one, make sure you check out the car's history as much as you can. Actually, in saying that, the best thing to do is go and watch our Ultimate Used Car Buyer's Guide because it'll take you through all of the stuff you need to check out before you buy, not just an RX-7, but any used car. Okay, inside problems. Firstly, there are loads of reports of like random electronic gremlins, but the thing is, it's often associated to like cheap and dodgy security systems not being installed properly. Also, the instrument clusters, they're known to like glitch out and sometimes completely fail. And this can be down to faulty or damaged connectors to the ECU or the capacitors leaking all over the circuit boards. Also, some of the early models can have some issues with earthing. That's why you'll sometimes see like crazy earthing kits in the early models. Next up, the leather on some of the factory seats. It can like wrinkle and crease really easily. And also the side bolsters, they can cop a flogging. Then there's other electrical issues like the HVAC system having problems, window switches failing, those sorts of gremlins. Also, just on the HVAC systems, non-factory air conditioning filters can actually force hot air back into the system and therefore the pump can fail. Also, as I mentioned, all of the interior plastics, they're starting to get really, really brittle, which means they rattle and creak. But worst case scenario, a lot of them just snap and break. Basically, what I mean is like anything, especially with a plastic hinge like these or these, they can just snap off. So many of these don't have lids on these two compartments and just broken plastics everywhere. Now, the major problem with this is that a lot of these parts are becoming really scarce, which then forces the price up. So even like really small little repairs can cost far more than anticipated. Now, if all of that wasn't confronting enough, mechanically, what goes wrong with the FD RX-7? I'd love to tell you, but I, I can't because I'm not a qualified mechanic, but Jim certainly is. Rotary people will tell you passionately that these things are reliable provided you get rid of a heap of the factory parts and do a bunch of modifications and follow a rigorous maintenance routine? Yeah, maybe. But really, that's not reliable. That's actually torture for some people and expensive torture. At this age, it's not so much a case of what might go wrong. It's a case of what can you do to possibly delay the inevitable catastrophic engine failure. When you really simplify it, what actually kills these things is uh, fuel related issues, so either running too rich or too lean, lubrication complications, that means from the oil pump internally or the external oil metering pump. Sometimes ignition systems can be the problem or cooling system issues. Now I should point out that that's the same things that kill all engines, but with these engines, all of those support systems are usually more complicated and more fragile than on most other engines. And yes, when all those support systems are operating perfectly, generally, yeah, no problem. But these engines, their tolerance to operate without everything being just right is very low. Air fuel ratios, ignition system, lubrication, cooling, it all has to be just right or it will die. So in standard unmodified form, if it's ever been driven or if you're planning on driving it, you're likely to have problems with the twin turbo system and all of the vacuum lines and solenoids that operate that. You'll definitely need to make sure all the fuel system is up to scratch, make sure the pump is okay, the regulator and the injectors all have to be spot on. The catalytic converters have a habit of melting down and usually that's from an air fuel ratio issue or an ignition system issue, but yeah, it's likely to melt down too. As for lubrication, very frequent servicing with the right oil is imperative. And unless you're gonna faff around pre-mixing your oil into the fuel, you must make sure that the oil metering pump is working flawlessly. The high underbonnet operating temperatures of these things do wreak havoc on everything electrical and in the cooling system made of plastic, so you really need to make sure that everything is just right there too. Now, unless you're in a position to spend a fortune on one of these that's already had everything fixed, the number one thing you're likely to have problems with is shitty mods and dodgy repairs. Chances are if it's one of the cheaper ones on the market, it is going to be modified and probably poorly. And that means the one of many reasons for these to blow up is most likely imminent. So yeah, cashed up collectors or hardcore enthusiasts only, unfortunately. Okay, 
so should you buy one? Well, this depends if you're single or in a relationship. If you're single, a hardcore RX fan, have money to burn to both pay for the car and to maintain it to the level that it requires, and you're buying an FD RX7 as a potential investment and only plan to drive it occasionally, yes, please buy one because these have become an iconic performance car. They're far from perfect, don't get me wrong, but it's important that the ones that are still out there on our roads are kept at their best. But if you're in a relationship but lust and desire over an RX-7, look, unless your better half has United Nation levels of understanding and diplomacy and you both have bulk cash and time, please do not buy one. See, chances are you're going to have to cut corners both in terms of maintenance and attention, both for the car and your relationship, and that's going to end in disaster. Look, overall, buying an RX-7 is like buying a vintage Porsche. Yes, it's incredible to drive and incredible to look at, and it's an experience, but my God, they require never-ending and fastidious commitment. If you are for that kind of commitment, look, awesome, well done, but the thing is, for what these cost, there are plenty of other performance cars out there that will uh, make your life easier and arguably just as enjoyable. Which then begs the question, for this sort of money, do you buy one of these or do you buy one of the other performance cars out there? Let us know what you would buy in the comments below and we'll see you next time. But it doesn't, like it's comfortable on a, on a long trip. Jesus Christ. Worst case can it race, go from there. Guys, we are talking about a rear wheel drive sports car. Here we go.